Hey, it's Glam Ham, and if you're like me and a fan of the secret of Skinwalker Ranch, you may also be tuning into Beyond Skinwalker Ranch. And you'll know that recently Travis and the team brought in a ham radio operator, ham radio specialist, Jerris Doverspike, to help to shed light on some strange and mysterious anomalies that have been happening on the ranch involving frequencies. I hope you enjoy this interview with Jerris Doverspike. Oh, look, you've got props behind you. Of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You've got... Uh, so what are we looking at there straight away? What is this curly looking antenna behind you? So that is... Are you familiar with Yagi antennas, I assume? Yes, yes. In okay. fact, hold on one second. <laughs> Am I familiar with Yagi antennas? Hold on. Check out this puppy. Oh, I see the rulers coming out. <laughs> it's the homemade tape measure Yagi antenna. <laughs> hey, we used space. We used uh, the rulers on our uh, uh, CubeSat satellite for our antenna. So it we there are rulers out there in space transmitting. So, wow, that's awesome! Yeah. That's fantastic. So carry on about your antenna that's behind you. So this is what I used a couple different times for uh, 1.3 gigahertz uh, Earth Moon Earth bounce. Uh, so if you're, I, I believe in a uh, the interview that I uh, watched of yours from the NASA people, they mentioned uh, moon bounce radio communications, yes. and yes. so uh, this is one of the ones. It was a high gain antenna. I've kind of shortened it down just to be used as a prop right now, uh, but it is a circularly polarized. Uh, basically the same sort of thing as a Yagi. You have your uh, elements that kind of uh, direct the beams, and then you have the reflectors and your active element. So it's the same, all the different same parts of as a Yagi antenna, just circularly polarized with circular elements. Actually, I got a couple of them here where it's just a little ring rather than it being linear. Is that so, like, uh, does it work almost sort of similarly? That wouldn't be like how a magnetic loop works then, would it? Because that actually polarizes, that actually has an antenna pattern that's sort of side to side and not actually circular, doesn't it? Um, No, not directly the same, but it does kind of use the same sort of effects um, as a magnetic. So in, in the same sort of direction, yeah. And so um, what's the official name for that antenna behind you with the little loops? Um, oh, but I have to. So it it is it, it is a Yagi antenna. Oh, it is still a Yagi, so, even with little loops. Yeah. So it's still a oh, Yagi, okay. but it is circularly polarized. And it does have uh, just the, the, the way that the benefit of having circularly polarized rather than uh, directionally, especially if you're doing EME or different sorts of things. You don't know the polarization that they're going to be coming in at. Wow. So having it circularly polarized gives you the benefit of not having uh, the vertical or horizontal polarization, but also it gives you whenever you have uh, right hand circularized or left hand circularized polarization, you can still sometimes get those communications as well. Wow. So, I mean, I've never done Earth, Moon, Earth, and uh, most of my antennas are vertical antennas mm -hmm. for now. So what actually, I mean, what direction do you point that? Is it sort of the long stick part of the antenna that you're pointing mm -hmm. to, to the moon? Yeah, the same, how the same way okay. you do with a Yagi antenna. Okay, you're, you're, okay. you're pointing it. it at whatever you're trying to transmit at. And what I actually have it on right now is a what is called a Star Tracker uh, Star Adventure GTI. So okay. what it does is that I can technically, as long as I set it up, I can tell it to point at any celestial object or any direction that I want to, and it'll automatically go to it and automatically follow it as the Earth rotates. Wow. So that really makes it a lot easier that rather than having to have... Uh, constantly holding something up towards oh, the yeah. moon or wherever you're yeah. going, you can just tell it, hey, I want you to be focused entirely on the moon. Or if you're doing radio astronomy, you can hook up whatever your antenna you're doing uh, your radio astronomy with, and you can point it at the sun. You can be pointing it at different uh, Jupiters, I believe another popular one, but pointing at whatever object that you're interested in and 
have it automatically track it for you wow. rather than having to set it up. And this is one of the things that's really nice whenever you're going out on like a field day or something like that, or especially if you're doing something like hound hunting, uh, you can have really very deterministic uh, understanding of where you're pointed in addition to uh, the strength of whatever signal that you're doing. So by sweeping across, you know what exactly the uh, speed at which you're going, and especially if you have some sort of, if you're getting really into it, you can have some sort of compass or accelerometer on it, and that'll allow you to be able to really, really uh, accurately pinpoint where you're pointing at, the field strength that you're receiving, and then being able to triangulate where the source is coming from. Did you say hound hunting? I did say hound hunting. Why did you say hound hunting and not fox hunting? Oh, sorry, fo fox hunting. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that, I thought it was a new thing that I like don't know about. And I was like, hound hunting. Why haven't <laughs> I heard of hound hunting? But you have your own terminology now. Nah, it, it's fox hunting. I just got the terminology That's so stuck cute, in my though. head. <laughs> That's very cute. Um, oh, my gosh. Speaking of cute. So you haven't seen the Barbenheimer yet. Is it tonight you're going? Or tomorrow, 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 tomorrow okay. I'm going okay. to our Oppenheimer. That's so funny, funny, funny. Um, okay, so back to antennas, right? So Earth, Moon, Earth. Um, and I hope it's okay that we're literally diving straight into. Oh, like, absolutely, this absolutely. Stuff. So you only need a, a technician's license to do Earth, Moon, Earth, don't you? You don't need anything more than a U.S. technician ham radio license. Is that correct to do Earth, Moon, Earth? I would have to double check the bands, but I'm fairly certain all you need is technician. Um, uh, I'd have to look back at the bands, but I know I, I, I'm general, so I do have a slightly uh, additional on top of it. But I, I'm fairly certain that uh, 23 centimeter is part of the technician band. Uh, if you could double look. check me on that. I can look right now because I'm never far from a band plan. <laughs> okay. I don't so... have mine on me, unfortunately. I'm a bad ham right now. <laughs> Um, right. So uh, let's have a look here. I mean, so, 23... as a disclaimer, I specifically use 1.3 gigahertz, but there are plenty of different bands that are also used for radio astronomy and EME as well. So you don't only have to use that one particular band. It's just one of the more common ones. I mean, I'm looking up here and all of this upper part doesn't seem to be delineated with any kind of license class. It only seems to divide up down here. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering if basically all of this entire section here that we see is technician. Because why doesn't it? So, it doesn't. Yeah. Yes, actually, now I remember it now. So what is, you are allowed to transmit on 23 but your license will determine the amount of power that you're allowed to transmit with. Okay. Oh, that so that's going to be the limiting factor is the amount of power. Okay. I know um, you're 200 watts for tech and gen, I, be I believe, and then 1500 in the US for extra. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not seeing any sort of license breakdowns for these ones up here. So, uh, and 23 centimeter, like there's nothing there that says extra. It seems to be down right. here on the HF bands where uh, mm -hmm. it breaks up. So that means if I'm, if I'm correct, uh, that even a brand new ham can dive straight, in, straight into trying to do earth, moon, earth. Yeah. It, it, so I will, it is challenging. It does require a lot of tinkering it does require a lot of being familiar with your equipment the limitations and how to get around that so it might be a little bit daunting to a new ham but if that is something that they are wanting to get into it's something that they can step into pretty pretty easily uh, especially if that's like the direct thing that they want to get into it'll bring down some of the cost but uh it is going to be on the pricier side of what you're going to be wanting to do just because you're going to be dealing with such weak frequencies uh so you're, you're going to be dealing a lot with uh, very directional antennas. So the full length of this antenna that I have here back behind me, this is about half of it. So okay. it's a six foot, about two meter and okay. length antenna that uh, I use for 23 centimeter EME. Uh, so 
And then on top of that, I have my uh, ICOM IC9700, which I use for that, which is only nice. five watts. But if you're talking with a station that has a large enough antenna, that five watts can be enough to get to them. It's going to be kind of your uh, the the losses at the different parts of your station in according uh, in addition to your uh, direction like that because it's the distance to the moon is going to be fairly significant in addition yes. to your bouncing off of it, which is going to wow. be another place where you're using a lot of uh, signal strength. But if you have a large enough uh, station that you're talking to, you can get away with five watts. And I've even heard of people getting away with less than that. So wow. uh, it's not impossible to, even with a small amount of power, be able to transmit and get signals back as well so i mean can you literally do it with an ht or do you have to use frequencies that an ht doesn't do which is handy talky for the non-hams and two meters and 70 centimeters most of these little hts are so is it other frequencies that you use for earth moon earth you said so, 1.3 gigahertz so i know right. that Normally is not you're... an ht no. Normally, you're wanting to use a little bit higher frequency just because of the properties of you're, you're bouncing it off of effectively ground. And right. so because of that, you're wanting to use more into the microwave band. But if I remember correctly, I have heard of people in those bands doing EME. So it's not impossible, mm -hmm. but you might be limited a little bit more on power regarding that just because uh, if there are charts out there that do give you graphs of the attenuation depending on the frequencies that you're transmitting at. So that is something that they do have data off um, radio. It's, it's the moon. So it's very pretty accessible and able to uh, do different studies on. So people have done sweeps and done uh, the data collection necessary to provide that uh, your decibel attenuation on uh, reflecting off the surface of the moon, uh, in addition to your free space loss. Um, so it, it you, all this data is out there for people to go take a look at and see, the, is their equipment able to do it? And uh, in addition to that, what size of antenna uh, gain would you be having to have right. in order to be able to have the other person receive it? Is there a certain website that's the main go-to for this Earth, Moon, Earth? I'm just turning my AC off because it's noisy here. There we go. Um, so in my research, there's not necessarily one particular website. I feel really bad, but I I, I read a lot of different, there's a lot of different presentations out there. There's a lot of different uh, members of the ham community that do a lot of EME and they put out uh, PowerPoint presentations and charts and uh, articles out there that will get you started in it. And that's how I started. I did a lot of, I probably a couple months of research before like buying anything and trying to figure out, wow. okay, what's the kind of thing that I need to do? I, I'm one of the, I'm an engineer. So I read the manual all the time and make sure that I you understand what's going manual. on. You read the manual. Okay. Yeah, I read the manual. I'm like, <laughs> but, uh, Especially with this, because there's just so much knowledge that you do need to have, but it's not there. A lot of been there have been a lot of people out there that they've done a lot of effort and taken a lot of their time to make this a lot more accessible. So it is more accessible now more than ever, but it is still going to take a little bit of time to get into. I mean, it sounds immediately because it has the word moon in it, very glamorous and <laughs> and cool, like to bounce a signal off the moon. And, and I take it the goal is like, if if my fist is the moon, you're bouncing and it's then refracting off to some other person on planet Earth. Yes. So there's multiple yes. skill levels here, not just to yeah. aim at the moon, but you've then got to refract on that certain angle back to your mm -hmm. buddy who's listening for you. So is that sort of like, what was the specific element that made you go, oh, I want to do that to the point that I'm going to spend money, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so I'm always, and this will kind of feed into a couple of different things, but research, well, not research, but, uh, outreach is one of the big things that I'm always a really big uh, proponent of. And if we're wanting ham to survive, we always have to get new people coming into it. And so back whenever I was a uh, member of the Space Hardware Club doing different radio projects and dealing with all these different things, one of the big things that we always did was outreach out to 
elementary, middle, and high school classes. And one of the things that we did and that we've actually managed to do a couple of times is get de dedicated space uh, radio time with the ISS. We were one of the schools that we put out a proposal saying, wow. hey, we would like to talk to the ISS. These are the things we want to do. We want to have students coming in to where they're talking to uh, these astronauts where school children talking with astronauts on the ISS and you get to see all uh, everyone's faces light up, oh, even like the man. teachers and everyone involved and ourselves included, because you know the, the difficulty that it takes to get all this stuff set up, not just the technical, but the administrative uh, being able to put out all the paperwork and then being chosen. Because wow. there's a lot of times where uh, just based on like, oh, we gave it to you last year in the past couple, uh, two or three years ago, we're going to let other people do it. So it's not just the quality of the proposal, it's the amount of time in between. So all of these different things go into it. And you're seeing all these people, we're talking to astronauts. And it's just oh, yeah. it's one of the coolest things. And, and having hands on to where <laughs> these people are getting involved and doing all these different things is what I have seen gets students most interested and getting involved with either space hardware or with ham radios or whatever it is, there's getting people hands on and allowing them to be the ones that are doing it. Yeah. And showing them that they can be doing it. Uh, that really proves to them and says, I want to learn more. Yeah. And once you get them hooked and get them saying, I want to learn more, that's where you're able to get them further and deep diving into where they are then reaching out more and getting the information themselves because they then have the drive rather than you kind of like talking at them, you right, are talking right, with right. them yeah, yeah, and they are interested in then learning more and working with them to then figure out what are you most interested, asking them those sorts of questions and then assisting them, giving the information along and allowing them to be the ones that are kind of driving their own destiny into ham radio or satellites, rockets, balloons, any of these other different things that we do. Uh, I love I and, love that your school like put the proposal together. Mm -hmm. but, like that you were so pro like these are our demands. You know, <laughs> that you were so proactive with it, you know, that's really really cool. Yeah. And it it, it it it's not even our school, it is a group of college students not necessarily Within administrators or professors okay. or anything. It is us students who are running a club, Space Hardware, and we have a separate department, Outreach. And we, as an outreach, said, we want to reach out to middle and high school students and get them interested in this. And we go out and say, one of the things that we want to spend our time and effort doing that we think would be most effective to get students interested in doing these is them talking to people I in the ISS, talking to right. astronauts. And right. so right. that is what gives us the passion to slog through all the paperwork, do all the proposals and everything, and to then talk with the students and get them interested in it. So who does outreach contact then? I mean, is there some little portal on the internet that's pretty easy to put your name in the pipeline of, we want to talk to the ISS at our school or our club, you know? Um, so it, it is handled by NASA. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact organization right now. It's slipping off of my brain. It's been a, uh, been a while since I've been involved with- uh, Is it like the PR, PR people of NASA kind of thing? Like- it would be that would be one of the departments that would uh, be working over. But there are other aspects of it, kind of like the because they want to make sure that if you are wanting to do it and you get it, you are able to do it because it it, it is pretty valuable time that's set aside for this. So if you're having other technical difficulties, right. that takes away from time that what other could. So there, there's a right. little bit of aspects of everything coming into it. Wow. So you have to have a very complete proposal. So but, when yeah. when you've spoken to the ISS, I mean, how long a time frame do you sort of what's the etiquette? Because, I mean, obviously you can't be. So tell me about when you were growing up. You know, I'm sure it has to be pretty concise and uh, a signal report. I mean, what do you talk about when you get an astronaut in the space station? Uh, so for the first thing on the timing is it's really not that that much time you're talking about 
depending on the orbit of the ISS, normally they set it up to where they're going to be directly overhead to maximize the amount of time that you have. But normally you're talking in order of 10 to 30 minutes at most. Oh, that sounds uh, so, a long time. So it is It is a decent that sounds amount a of time. time. Yeah. Um, but uh, in terms of what you're able to talk about, pretty much anything that the, the kids want to talk about. And just, it's really fun because you also get to hear the... Uh, astronauts on the ISS, I, I know that they have extremely tight uh, schedules and everything, and they are working. They got constantly. places to go. Right. No, they but nowhere to go. They, they view talking with the kids and everything as kind of a break from their normal duties. And you get to hear based on like the excitement of the kids, the, the astronauts are all excited in addition Aww. to everybody. So it, it's just a little bit of everything because they know they are making the next generation of scientists of engineers of radio astronomers or whoever they are teachers they are setting them up to be ex as excited as possible to them be to them then get excited and do everything that they can to be successful in these different fields and they just have that knowledge and so it excites them and excites us and just everyone in the room is excited and so it, it's a really great feeling and it's just a, a fantastic atmosphere that everyone's learning everyone's having a great time so and now is this something you still try and do do you still try and catch the iss when it's going over um not so much i'll listen in occasionally um but normally uh I, I like to let other people have that excitement just because uh, normally whenever you do hear them overhead, you normally do have kind of a little bit of a traffic jam with everybody trying to yeah. talk up there and everything. So just because I've had these opportunities, I like to allow other people to have as much time as possible. I know that kind of like noble and that sort it's of thing. It's so but, noble. <laughs> that is the word I was thinking of. So for people who have, uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure you can listen even on normal handy talkies, mm -hmm. can't you? So is it the same frequencies that they're using as they circle the world at five miles a second, supposedly, like every 90 minutes they go around the planet? They're on those same frequencies the whole time. So if you have a monitoring radio, do you happen to know off the top of your head what the frequency is that that you listen to on your handy talkie? And is it kind I of like, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I, I want to say 144 and 440 are the two frequencies that they operate off of. But I can double check that real quick. Look at uh, that real but, quick. I mean, it, it's definitely, yeah, it's 145.99 for the uplink and downlink is 437.8. So it's, if you have a standard dual frequency or you have two different radios, uh, you can either talk to or listen to the ISS. You can listen if you have one. So, so I grab here, I've got my, I'm growing uh, radios, <laughs> as you can see. And I just got the newest one as well this week. Look at this. Come on. That's impressive, Fancy. right? Um, so if I take my pick, I know so many people have the Baofeng. I'm willing to take the flak. So if I have my Baofeng and my Anytone, for example, what frequency? I'll put one, just one of those frequencies you just said, mm -hmm. and then either, and then another radio at the other frequency. Yep. And one is if I was going to try and transmit and one is the listening. Yep. So your uplink would be on 145 and then the downlink would be on the 440. Uh, okay. So, and, and, and for those, um, you know, to be super clear. So your uplink is you transmitting right, to them. Right. Okay. That would and be you downlink. talking okay. to the ISS. They right. would talk back down on the 440 megahertz band. Why do they have, why do they make it such a wide gap? Because, for example, when you use a repeater, it's just such a a narrow uh, shift between the two frequencies. Why does why is it such a big gap with uh, the space station? Do you know? Is that a so silly one question? Of the, no, no, absolutely. No, there's no such thing as a silly question. Uh, so 
I don't know exactly why, but I can hypothesize a couple of different things. One of the big things is because they're moving so quickly and because they are an orbiting object, one of the difficulties that you have to deal with is the Doppler effect. And so as they're coming in closer to you, they're going to be, even though they're on one about 146 megahertz, you might see it quite significantly higher at like 147 or something like that. Hmm. So you kind of have to do a little bit of uh, adaptation as they're going overhead. It'll drop down to their, as they're directly overhead, it'll be exactly whatever they're transmitting at, at 145.99. And then as they start going away, it'll start dropping a lot down. The best way that I like to explain this kind of effect is whenever you're hearing ambulances come towards you Mm -hmm. and then pass you and go away, you hear it, that sort of thing yeah and so the frequency will be higher at the beginning and overhead and as they go past it'll be lower wow so i because they have to deal with that doing separating it out entirely to another different band will allow you to make sure you're not uh talking over things and then it will also allow you to where you're able to both transmit and receive at the same time so the same sort of thing as like the repeaters i've just had a brilliant idea I'm sure I'm not the first person to have had this. So I have behind me one of the things we're going to talk about. I have an RTL SDR dongle, uh, which for those people who are listening or watching, it's literally like a little thumb drive. Uh, It looks like over here, this tiny silver thumb drive, which is what I have seen used on my favorite show, Skinwalker Ranch. But this thing's like 30 bucks. And as you can mm-hmm. uh, see on my screen, so I'm listening. So for anyone who has this $30 worth of equipment, even without a ham radio license or mm-hmm. a ham radio, you can simply tune to, what was it, one, four? What was the frequency you said was the downlink? Sorry, the four, yep. four. So it'll be 437.8 megahertz. 437, what... Okay. Yeah, that's the one that you would listen on. Okay, great. So 437.8, you'd put on your, whatever your SDR dongle is, um, whether you've got the RTL or the Hack RF or there's tons mm-hmm. of them now, but, and you can listen to the space station, which is crazy cool. Now, what's the website that you might recommend? I have a Geochron that shows the tracking of the space station and I haven't done it yet, but how do you, what do you recommend for people to know when to even listen, when they know the space station is over them on planet earth? Normally I go directly to NASA's website. They have a really great graphic on where the ISS is and the next couple of orbits. Um, I know whenever we were doing, uh, the actual proposal, they would give us specific dates on when they would be overhead at specific locations because uh, I'm in Huntsville, Alabama. So we have the advantage of being really closely uh, to uh, NASA Marshall and the Space and Rocket Center here. And there's a significant amount of people here from NASA. So uh, there, we, we do have a little bit of a benefit from that. So, uh, But There are lots of different NASA resources, but they're just due to uh, the popularity of the ISS and this. There's plenty of additional websites that you can pretty much choose whichever one is your favorite graphics. Or if you're wanting to pick out, I'm here, when is the next uh, orbit that I'll get uh, there? There's plenty of resources out there as well for that. So uh, So we would just Google. I mean, I think one is even called ISS Tracker rings Mm -hmm. a bell um so i'd be interested in the one where if i say i'm here by the hollywood sign when is the space station over me i'd want something to show me and then what sort of time window does it give i mean for them to be over you where you can hear them like uh how much time window can you can you listen for like an hour or is it like oh 20 minutes and they're here and gone you know how fast is it so ISS uh, does orbit very, very quickly. I think their orbit is something along the lines of a couple of hours is an entire day for them, technically. Uh, so in terms of what you would realistically be able to listen to, you're probably, uh, if they're fairly eccentric, fairly far away from you in terms of directionality, you're probably talking about 
five, 10 minutes. If they're directly over, directly overhead, you get a little bit closer to 20 ish minutes. Okay. The other advantage I thought, I think we can agree. My idea is brilliant, right? About the $30 dongle. Okay. The, I got a RTL high SDRs, wonderful. I get okay. them out all the time. Okay, great. I want to pimp it out because I may not have another brilliant idea. So I need to really draw attention to this one <laughs> that if you have the dongle, when you said that because of the Doppler effect, maybe they're going to be switching like a frequency away, one whole number away or something. If you've got your uh, waterfall, your scope, you would see that transmission moving to another frequency. So you would even have an advantage listening with the dongle over somebody with a handy talkie with a little ham radio. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, cool, cool, cool. So, um, so Skinwalker Ranch. So here are you, you're a smart guy. In a nutshell, what do you actually do? Do you have like a top secret job that you're not allowed to talk <laughs> about with engineering? Or you don't have to tell me anything, of course, uh, that uh, we can say that till after the. <laughs> but like, what is your actual job? Um, so I'll kind of go back to uh, what I did at university. Uh, so I used to work uh, at a university in Huntsville and I actually used to work directly. Tra Dr. Travis Taylor was one of my customers. Aww. So I've been in meetings with him. I've talked with him directly. Uh, I've built walls out of giant Legos to make little office spaces. Aww. So uh, it, it, I, I've worked with him directly. So that's kind of how I got involved with all this. But mostly I, I uh, for a lack of a better term, while I was working for him, I was kind of a quote unquote problem solver. He would come okay. to our small group and say, hey, I need to figure out how to do this particular thing. And we would go out and we would find, uh, normally we'd have to also do it on a really, really, really tight budget. So we would go out, we would figure out, okay, this is what you gave us. This is what our proposed solution is. Do you want us to do it? And that that's kind of uh, what I would do for him. I've now gotten into a little bit more of a uh, technical managerial role. So working on uh, a couple of different projects. So, yeah. Now, when you did this problem solving, what sort of problems are we talking about? Like what what kind of problems are you allowed to say or is it <laughs> secret? No, this, this is all stuff that would be published in okay. academic journals and stuff like that. But uh, it, so the big problem that we were solving is trying to figure out how do we measure the efficiency of a particular object? And this would be CubeSat satellites, so really small 10 centimeter cubed little devices that you send into space. Uh, how do you measure its efficiency at being able to point at a particular location? I see. So, that, that's kind of what we were doing. And so we were trying to figure out, all right, if we're wanting to control these different satellites, what's the different devices that's going to give us the best pointing accuracy as well as the best overall control? So that was that was kind of the stuff that I had worked on. Do people ever, since it's been in the news so much lately with apparently the Navy uses a game controller and of course the doomed Titan sub used it. Did you, do you guys, or did you ever use game controllers for trying these experiments? Uh, no. So normally what we did is we hooked up our command and control software into uh, a software called MATLAB and that allows you to do a lot of uh, very strong computations and we then sent that to whatever controller that we were using and that pointed at where we were uh, pointing at. And if you're uh, in the engineering space, what we were talking about is a hardware in the loop simulator. And so it would send feedback back to the computer that you're doing and that would real time adjust what the uh, simulator in the computer was looking at. And then it would send data back to uh, the device you're looking at and it's just a loop that would be going back and forth that would be right. sending the status and adjusting in uh, space. And so you would get that basically simulating entire space missions from wow. the ground. I'll take that as a hard no on the game. Controller. <laughs> um, and so you already had this background with Dr. Travis Taylor. Did he used to use the word anomaly? I, so I'll be honest. Um, I never was a big watcher of the show. So I, that was not a key word for me to be picking on to saying anomaly. <laughs> uh, so 
It wouldn't shock me if he did. He, he, <laughs> Dr. Travis Taylor on TV is the absolute same as the Dr. Travis ah, Taylor in real life. That's nice. So it, it, it is not an act. It, it, it is actually him. I mean, he's really excellent. They're all excellent on TV. And and then I, I love the show for anyone listening. This show, it takes place in Northeast Utah on an actual ranch called Skinwalker Ranch, where there have been strange anomalies that are very sort of paranormal and, and involve UAPs, UFOs. And I mean, the sightings they've had on that show are amazing. But I had a specific question. I'm so excited that I get to talk to you because because you did something really neat and something specific when they had you on the show. They need they keep picking up this phenomenon that when they aim rockets up and disturb the environment, they're getting a frequency coming in at 1.6 gigahertz. And they wanted to switch it up and have someone transmit on 1.6 gigahertz. Now that, as you called it on the show, is not in the ham band. Right. Mm -hmm. But you said you were able to make use of harmonics, which are sort of uh, anybody you, who's at all familiar with like music or sound, you know, that the one note actually can also generate other sister notes, in essence, um, at mathematically distanced frequencies. Um, so. How did you, though, manage to transmit on 1.6? Because, I mean, if you knew that there's a harmonic, isn't it still like, aren't you still not allowed to do that? Or was it just a case of, oh, well, the show will be responsible if we get into trouble here? Because <laughs> obviously it's research, you know. Right. So I am still, I have to follow, like I said on the show, I have to follow all the FCC yeah. guidelines on uh all the clarity of the information on the signals that I'm sending. So I can't intentionally distort the signal that I'm sending out in order to add additional energy uh, into the, the specific harmonics. But one of the things that I was doing is uh, wanting to transmit on uh, the one point, 144 megahertz, one of the, uh, the 11th uh, harmonic, in addition to the uh, 400 and something megahertz harmonic, which would be the fourth harmonic of 1.6, uh, up to 1.6 gigahertz. So even though I'm not necessarily going to be getting a lot of uh, power into the 1.6 gigahertz region, uh, one of the things that we were looking at potentially doing is, is it potentially like we were talking about earlier, where we have the uplink and the downlink, are they potentially also potentially monitoring these other frequencies that we can transmit on? In addition to like what I was saying is taking advantage of the harmonics and seeing if we use a multiple, is that something that we could potentially maybe see something getting back to us from? So does okay. that kind of answer the question there? So or? so what what actual frequency did you use to ping that 1.6 gigahertz? So I used one uh, 145.45 uh, megahertz, and then I used... Uh, 430 so i was going to use the 400 megahertz band somewhere in there but because we were seeing so much down on 154 we decided that we wanted to stick on that and that's why uh you see the radio and that's where uh we stuck at because we were just seeing so much activity and response on that specific uh frequency um <laughs> but if we didn't if we were if we didn't see anything there and we were to move up i would have moved up i believe at 435 something uh, uh the radio that i have doesn't get directly to uh the harmonic so i was going to be somewhere in the 1.6 region uh just because they also see not directly at 1.6 but kind of around that band as mm. well so uh kind of looking at that and uh, doing what I can do with my specific radios and making sure, like I was talking about with the uh, sanit uh, how sanitized my uh, signals are, I want to make sure that I'm following all the FCC guidelines. Uh, and so I'm not going to get a lot of energy into mm -hmm. the 1.6 region, right? but it might be enough that it excites something. Mm, right, right. And was it the ICOM 9700 you used yes. to do that? And did you have it at how many watts were you actually on the main frequency? 
So I was transmitting at 80% power at uh, about 50% microphone sensitivity. So I would have been transmitting at about 80 watts since okay. uh, the 145 megahertz power is 100 watts. Okay, okay. And um, so in the show, of course, we see for all of like 60 seconds you're doing <laughs> it. How long did you really stand there? Like how many times did you key up? Or was it really as it was in the show? So I, before we had uh, the person come on and speak on the microphone, I had probably been listening. Uh, I had it probably set up for two or three hours while they were doing other stuff. Um, and I didn't see too much interesting out there. I saw your standard kind of uh, spurious signals. I saw the, uh, a couple, what I would assume to be satellites, because I was seeing the Doppler shift, like, uh, if you if you uh, zoom out a little bit on your RTL SDR, sometimes you'll see different uh, signals that'll go one direction, kind of flatten out, and then move in the other direction. Mm. More than likely, that's a satellite. Okay. Um, but I was seeing just what you would normally expect to see, and then you saw I called CQ uh, for it. Didn't really see very much, but uh, whenever the one lady I forget her name. Uh, was speaking on the microphone, there was definitely more correlation with different anomalies, to use a Travis yes, Taylor yes. term. Uh, there was definitely more correlation than if I was to do it. And that not only while uh, I was speaking on the ham radio, but while she was just speaking verbally in the presence of it, there was certainly, and we would ask it questions like, is it this? And it would, within like a second or two, change wow. kind of how you were seeing on the TV show. Wow. And uh, it would seem like it was responding in a way that was deterministic uh, to some of the questions. Um, I am a skeptic. I believe that it might have been something else. But even though... There was strangest. There was core. There, it felt like there was a correlation. Yeah, yeah. Between what was us doing and yeah. this thing that we were seeing on the RTL SDR. And um, yeah, for people who haven't seen that episode, um, not to give a huge spoiler because I think you should watch the whole show because it's excellent and super fun. But they're trying to get this uh, pinging on the one point six gigahertz. And they discovered that a lady who used to live on a certain property that had similar anomalies, when her voice would speak, they would get this reaction, right? This elevated frequency on the 1.6 gigahertz, which, I mean, in the show, it looks startling. So it's kind of good to hear you confirm that that did happen within one or two minutes of her speaking, you know. It, it, it wasn't minutes. It was pretty much a second or two after wow. she was done talking. Wow. Wow. I mean, that's amazing. Like. Because they they did it with another lady as well and had the same thing happen. And I was watching the show talking out loud, like, get the women, <laughs> get the women, ask them more questions, you know. And so for the two or three hours, you said you were just listening and monitoring. You weren't keying up or anything then. And you or were you doing some keying up? I did key, uh, key up a couple of times. I did want to make sure that whenever we were going to key up on the signal that I wasn't going to be talking over other people. So right. I would call CQ occasionally on the frequencies that I would uh, be right. wanting to transmit right. on. So making sure that it's clear. I Got also it. checked the uh, local band plans from uh, the Denver, Colorado area. So right. I wanted to make sure that I was following all of their best practices as well. And uh, from everything that I could tell, we were following uh, not even not just FCC best practices, but also making sure that we were following the band plan for Denver. Yeah, um, that's great. That's great. What a good ham. <laughs> I try you. to be. I, I, I like to you. kind of like, like I was showing, uh, talk, talking about earlier, my big reason for saying yes to appearing on the show is I wanted to do an amount of outreach. I wanted to try to give some good science to the TV show and uh, and a skeptical mind, someone that hasn't really watched the TV show. So I'm coming in with a uh, neutral point of view. Yeah, and I'm not really uh, coming in with, I, I'm going to see this thing happen. Yeah, I'm that's right. With, uh, I'm not expecting to see anything. Yeah. 
but if we see something that's really cool yeah 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 that's uh probably really ideal that you went in that way um Here's another question, and I've seen a couple people ping on my TikTok channel, um, and they've said, because uh, you, you, of course you get the skeptics with people right. thinking all the reasons you could get that pinging on the 1.6 gigahertz, and somebody put, you know, I mean, for heck's sake, what's the frequency of the laptop they're using? <laughs> and I mean, aren't some older laptops literally like 1.6 gigahertz for their little processors and stuff? Mm -hmm. Could that be something to do with it? Um, so it is a potential, um, and especially it's going to be a little bit more of a problem on the RTL SDRs that you are seeing, but there was also things where I was seeing as we were starting to transmit, I was seeing even on my uh, IC9700, even whenever I, uh, my uh, 8600 was my big receiver, that's the one that I had uh, going through the 1.6 to significantly higher than that just scanning through that area okay. where i was picking up additional strangeness happening in that area mm. as well so and i'm using uh this right here which is a linear power uh sorry no it's a switching power supply okay but it is not running off computer it is running off 120 uh volts 60 hertz mains and it is i've tested it with my signal analyzer and everything and it's fairly free, fairly clean but whatever we were doing this i was seeing additional stuff on 1.6 hmm. with my stuff separate uh and i would be able to see on it uh through the different waterfalls that i was looking at if that was going to be my cpu or my computer interfering in that for at least what I was doing, was not the case. Hmm. Well, that's that then. <laughs> um, I mean, if you had to be a hardcore, hardcore skeptic, what other things could it be? I mean, here's something I wondered, right? So with the harmonics, basically, now I'm going to put this in super layman and then you can <laughs> polish it up a bit. With a harmonic, Basically, you're just kind of dividing it into like it's almost like half and half again or double and double again, right? Is that how you do harmonics or like how do you calculate where the ping is going to be of your um, signal? So with harmonics, there's two ways of kind of doing it. You can either look at harmonics up or mm -hmm. you can look at harmonics down. So it it's really just it, it it really simple. So like say 100 megahertz, you're wanting to figure out what the different harmonics are. You have your base frequency. First harmonic is going to be n plus one is your multiplier, so two. Uh, your first harmonic is going to be two times the original signal, so it's okay. going to be 200 double. megahertz. So For the double. next one, <laughs> next one's going to be triple. Next one's going to be four times, and okay. just so on and so forth. Okay. Now, of course, you're going to be having less and less power being uh, sent on each additional signal, depending on the cleanliness of your radio and all the different stuff you're doing. Uh, and then if in the other direction, 1.6 gigahertz, your first uh, derivative harmonic is 800 megahertz. Okay. And then your third is going to be something but your fourth harmonic is going to be in the 400 megahertz and then you can and that's why i was wanting to do the 400 megahertz range to get in roughly the 1.6 gigahertz because like i was saying earlier the more times you have to multiply or divide you're significantly dropping off the power right right so right that's right. why we're looking at getting on multiple different not just the the one eleventh harmonic at 154 right but also bumping it up and getting it to where at the 400 and some megahertz you would get into the fourth harmonic got it got it got it so with is the downward uh how it was for example i liked it when you used the 100 megahertz because it was nice and easy so 100 megahertz your first harmonic 200 megahertz third harmonic 300 megahertz so when you go down is it that same formula basically mm -hmm. okay okay so it's taking you just be dividing by n plus one rather than multiplying by n plus right one. right but it's just going to be a mirror image of the upwards ones to the downwards ones is that right pretty effectively like placements yeah. okay um, uh, so you don't normally get receive on so if you were to say 
you're transmitting it on 100. You're not going to see anything on 50. You're not going to see anything on 33. You're not going to see anything on 20. You're only going to be getting power up of that. So if you're wanting to transmit up to 1.6 gigahertz, you can use lower, but you can't say, I want to transmit at 1.6. I'm going to use 3.2. Got it, got it, got that, it, got, that it, got it, got it. So you can't have downwards harmonics. Like, no, that, no, no, because because that is your fundamental frequency. And so remember the thing that I was talking about, N plus one, you can't get into without negative numbers. And then you're getting into imaginary, those complex figures and getting into oh, really weird realms of mathematics. Because um, my big harmonic thing that I looked into, of course, is this notorious Baofeng UV5R that's <laughs> famous for the spurious emissions. And I'm always drawing pictures of it in my live. And I draw the line, the spike, and then more spikes to show the spurious emissions. But I had thought that if there's a spike, that it also will go on the other side. So in in essence, if this is the main frequency, you'll get them going like this, but you're saying that's not the case. So or that is not will. harmonics. Oh, they're you just spurious other... emissions. Got it, right. got it, got it, got it. Because in my head, I was like, but I could swear the Baofeng did that. But of course, you don't call them harmonics then. You call them spurious emissions. Yeah. I mean, how else do you describe the difference between them then? Because... They're so, kind of similar, right? No, no, they're very, very similar. They're just kind of on deficit. Uh, so you're looking, one is kind of like looking at a microscope and the other one's looking at a telescope. So like the spurious emissions is going to be like looking at a, uh, a microscope and looking at the weird things that are happening on the small okay. micro scale. Okay. Whereas looking at the uh, harmonics is going to be looking up like in a, to a telescope and you're seeing all these big effects that are happening. Okay. Okay. So I think you, they, this has answered my question then, because one of the things, oh, well, hang on a minute before, before I see if I've answered my question, when the spurious emissions happen, as, is there always a mathematical formula for that? Or does it vary depending on the radio and the bad manufacturing and stuff? Or are they always following some rule? It's going to be both. So depending on the quality and the different components that are being used, it's going to change different constants. And that's going to be changing the different visuals that you're seeing okay. through the spurious emissions. Okay. So it's kind of a little bit, uh, but they are still following those same mathematical laws. So if you have two different radios with the same properties and they're both bad in the same way, they're both going to be having those weird spurious uh signals in the same fashion. Got it. Got it. So what I was thinking, uh, which I think this is a no, but, but this is my head thinking, what could make that 1.6 gigahertz frequency? So what if you did have something that would, so if it's double, it's going to be 3.2 and then 6.4. So what if you had something really powerful on a 6.4? So you said that the harmonics don't go downwards, they only go up. But what if, in essence, it was making spurious emissions that just happen to fall upon 1.6 gigahertz? What if it's some technology that we're not even thinking about? And maybe it's way, it could be like a 300 gigahertz or something that we're not even familiar with. And its spurious emission is 1.6 gigahertz. I'm That's gonna... an interesting question. Give me a minute to kind of yes. I shall do my it. I shall do my my spy look <laughs> while you think. So my one concern with that is spurious emissions require, by definition, a larger signal to be the main kind of your base signal for it to be bounced off of. So we would be seeing something huge in comparison to the one point six, more than likely based on what we're since we're talking about spurious mostly going to be something close and i can't necessarily think of no of course i haven't i'm not doing any research on this right now this is just things going off my memory and as we've saw earlier i'm not always the best at remembering all of these different things but i can't directly think of anything that would be what would provide what you're talking about in terms of the spurious emissions rather than it being some weak signal that we're seeing from something else directly I mean, what if it's something so powerful that it's not even going to ping on our 
radio spectrum other than this giant gap like can there can be huge gaps between spurious mm-hmm. emissions right so what mm-hmm. if your whole radio spectrum is only catching one spurious emission that's this 1.6 gigahertz am i stretching am i reaching its <laughs> withdrawals here <laughs> but it's like so what my only concern with that is we have measured up even into like past the terahertz range. Okay. And I'm I'm trying to think of what we would see is some sort of saturation f- at some sort of measurements that we're trying to see. And it would be like, okay, Huge, we can like measure this up thick to, or something, like a giant, you'd see a giant strong. It, it would be far larger than that. It would be basically where you would see, uh, imagine starting at one of those peaks, except it stays peaked at the top and it just continues wow. to go on okay, okay. for a while uh, in terms of what you would be seeing here. Just because in order to get that sort of effect, you would have to be putting so much energy out there that we basically would be swamped out everything else in that area. Um, not to say that that isn't possible, um, but it would have to be past anything that we've measured uh, in terms of that, in order to see those sorts of effects. The, the other thing is that normally with spurious emissions, it's not super stable. Uh, whereas we have seen where the 1.6 gigahertz seems like it is fairly stable. Um, so that might be another thing that it means that it might not be a spurious emission. But that that is that is a really interesting sort of question that I might have to look into a little bit more. I think you MC. need to call Dr. Travis Taylor. <laughs> Tell him I've I've solved the show. I beat the show <laughs> like you beat a game. <laughs> so how high has, has humanity measured on spectrums? Like how high can we go to see these frequencies? I don't know exactly off the top of my head, but I know for a fact because the different things that we need, one of the things that we are measuring is like spins of electrons and other super duper micro effects. And that's when you start really getting into these really, really fast terahertz style uh, frequencies. And these let off so little amounts of energy that we're kind of trying to look at that um, we have to get really close and we have to uh, have really sensitive measuring uh, equipment. But we are able to like measure different particle uh I think one of the things that we do use that for is uh, trying to, like whenever we're looking at singular electrons, seeing how fast they go around the different uh, orbitals of of molecules. Um, I believe that's one of the, and I think that's pretty significantly up up there in the terahertz range. So that's going to be, that will be one of your limiting factors of how fast anything can go. That's kind of like going to be your universal speed limit of, uh, how fast signals can go is how fastly, how quickly can something move at that speed? Um, More, I think it's how much, how sensitive is our equipment to capture that is, that and is measure the other it. Because I think it's probably infinite. I mean, yeah, I'm sure there's, yeah, there's, I'm sure there's elements of physics that, I'm sure there's elements of physics that we haven't quite nailed yet. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I would have to talk to my theoretical physicist buddy before I start making any yes, real yes, yes. statements of because because uh, photons would are mostly determined by the amount of energy that they're carrying would give you that frequency, which is why we can see a lot of different of, of the effects that we see in physics. Um, so it, it would be interesting to see just how much energy can a photon handle? Is there a speed limit? to how quickly something can vibrate. That that is an interesting question. I mean, it might just change into like almost some gaseous something. (laughs) You like it could change its uh, composition or something in some way. I don't know. Uh, (laughs) I'm not a physicist. I just think I am. Um, (laughs) So let me see. Um, See, there's some, some other questions about this. So what, when you came away from it then, I mean, you must have, you're a smart guy. What did you think it was causing that 
especially after the lady spoke, what did you and your rational mind think it was? The lady comes and speaks and says, we know you there, you know, and the ping comes up on 1.6 gigahertz. So what is Jerris and your brain thinking? So the, the effects that we were seeing weren't necessarily limited to 1.6. We were seeing kind of just general energy levels across the entire spectrum. Okay. Um, and, and that's kind of what, whenever you're seeing your RTLSDR, sometimes it'll do a noise adjust and that sort of thing. But we were seeing that far more than I've really seen here and uh, I've even seen like whenever I was doing it in like cities near universities that are doing different uh, RF uh, experiments. One of the things that we were, we were seeing is uh, it being far less stable than what it was previously. Um, and I would want to say my rational mind is saying it's something with my radio that it's seeing it, it's seeing that I'm transmitting and then it would stop. And then it would adjust the noise floor. But we were seeing it adjust up and down far more than I've seen elsewhere. And as far as I'm aware, we uh, it was set up with the normal stock settings, just looking at a specific area that they were looking at. Uh, and that I don't have an answer to. So yeah, I thought there's it was... been a couple, there, there was okay. a couple things of like, okay, I know what's causing this, but I don't know why this additional response exists. Do you believe so, that humans and human energy can impact a frequency spectrum? Like thoughts um, or excitement? I would almost say more so presence than anything else, because we humans have a, an inherent capacitance. They have an inductance. They have a resistance. So technically that's all the different elements that you need to have some sort of filter or some sort of uh, other electrical device. So you can charge up a, a person and ha increase their voltage and uh, that would increase different capacitative effects and everything. Uh, so there's definitely uh, scientific ways that we can affect these different sorts of things. Like uh, if you go up to your uh, antenna and you touch it, it's going to change the way that your waveform is more than likely going to look. My, I, I haven't. Uh, okay, I, I see that. you see a little bit of stuff where you're uh, seeing a little additional green in there, uh, but the other thing is like, uh, have you ever seen the theremin, the instrument? Yes, yes. Where you don't actually touch you anything, you move your hands. Mm -hmm. And you have the same sort of capacitance and inductance nice. effects to where even without touching it, you have some sort of effect. So yeah, there's definitely basis to where humans can affect things nearby them without directly like touching them. So there, there is some precedence. I just don't know how far it goes. And that's kind of where the, the interesting thing is like, can we devise experiments that show these different things and, uh, if I had a lot more time on my hands, that might be something that I would be uh, interested in pursuing a little bit further. But uh, I don't necessarily have the time or money to be able to do what I view as a uh, really good deep dive into these sort of effects. But I, I know that there are a lot of different things that kind of would be things that we would build off of in order to get to kind of what you're talking about. I mean, we're basically incredible transceivers, aren't we? Mm -hmm. We're biological transceivers. We receive and we transmit. We're the antennas as well. We can pick up feelings from and vibes and stuff. Um, that stuff, anything to do with frequencies fascinates me. And that was the draw to ham radio and music as well. Um, so what uh, you mentioned, if you had more time on your hand, what What's your dream thing that in your life you hope, oh, man, I really would love to do this. I mean, you've already checked off talking to the ISS. You've already got a fancy antenna behind you <laughs> with cute little circles on it. So what would you really want to do? Money, no object. What would be your experiments that you want to do? Money, no object. I think it would be really fascinating to try to, if not even necessarily be the person that is uh, starting 
civilization on Mars being someone that kind of is devising either the habitats or the different things that are necessary for us to uh, be able to inhabit these uh, outside of Earth planets in addition to the moon. Uh, Because once we start doing that, you have a lot more money and everything going into space flight and you potentially increase the amount of funding and research towards like nuclear thermal rockets and fusion rockets and all these different tech because i back whenever i was in college i was thinking about potentially going into a physics field for masters and phd looking at uh doing uh electric nozzles for nuclear uh fusion rockets and that would be something that would get us to alpha centauri and other stars nearby uh that would be the technologies that would get us there so i i think if money no object, I would fund habitation on uh, definitely the moon and Mars. And then potentially one of the projects that I did for my capstone project was uh, landing devices on Venus. What does that take? And you see a lot of different science fiction authors looking at floating cities in the venus atmosphere Mm. and so that would be a really cool thing to look into uh, because one of the things that we discussed a little bit earlier was balloons and that and so that would just be a really big balloon that would have a city or something inside of it and that would be a really cool problem to kind of try to go in and solve not necessarily ham related but (laughs) which place would be more easy to live on between the moon and mars would you say to make a habitat moon and mars uh, so th- in in terms of ease, at least in the short term, definitely is going to be the moon just because you kind of have that lifeline of Earth where you don't have to wait uh, between months to years to get, th- well, weeks to months to get stuff from Earth to Mars because you're talking about orbits have to be right and weather and everything has to be right in order to get stuff to Mars. I don't, have you ever seen uh, the movie, the Martian? Uh, I mean, was that with Gina Davis? That um, movie? Was she the, in the, the movie I'm talking about the one with Matt Damon, where he's the oh. astronaut that gets, Oh yes, I did Mars. see that. Yes, I did. Uh, and, and that sort of thing where it, all this space stuff takes so much time right now. Mm. And to get everything up to it, I think in the short term, definitely, moon would be a lot easier to solve but once you start getting your habitation set up just because of uh just how small the moon is uh just how much radiation that you get on the moon mars by virtue of having different uh ground effects like you have lava tubes in mars that you can take advantage of that you can set up inflatable habitats inside of and the martian regolith will block out all the radiation so long term mars is going to be a little bit of an easier uh place to live especially once you start getting uh farms and water solved i think uh um NASA, I know a couple of people at NASA myself, and I swear they said that the radio signal, you might know if this is right, takes 13 minutes to come from Mars back to Earth. Yep. That's a really frustrating conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that, that that's one of the big things, especially with like uh, that one of the advancements that AI has really been able to fast fo- uh, enhance is our ability to explore mars and these different other locations because you're able to make decisions locally on these faraway places that uh you would have to wait 13 minutes between commands you're like oh i want i want to see that rock i want to see that that, that's an interesting rock look at that uh whereas with ai you can take a look and say okay i'm seeing all of these different things around me the i'm identifying these different things as the best things to go and look at for scientific information and uh, and so that's one of the things that AI is really kind of being able to uh, enhance. And have you have you seen the uh, dragonfly robot that we put on Mars? The little yeah. like helicopter doodad that uh, does little couple minute hops in between uh, different locations. I don't think I have actually. No. So it I is. I need to the, look at that. <laughs> it's a really really cool thing because you have not only were are we now doing your standard like curiosity 
uh, rovers and that sort of thing. And those things are a lot bigger than you probably think. They're about the size of like cars to buses, depending okay. on the ones that you're looking at. Uh, this Dragonfly robot is the CubeSat size that I was talking about earlier. They're, they pretty much are about the size of your hand. But even though Mars has such a thin atmosphere, we are now able to, with our advances in miniaturizing electronics, we're able to now have devices that are flying around autonomously on Mars. Wow. Which I think is just a really, really cool thing. Yeah. I'm a space engineer, so I geek out about that stuff. So um, I love how, by the way, your specific thing you were interested in was the cap of a nuclear fusion rocket. It was like so specific, the cap of it. <laughs> the like, nozzle, yeah, yeah, yeah. The nozzle. You just you want to be in on the nozzle of the nuclear fusion rocket. That's what you said, right? Like mm -hmm. I've never thought of things in in terms of being so specific like that. Um, I mean, just getting back to your ham that you did on on the TV show. So you've been on a show that's really themed around these UFOs and UAPs. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think there's already stuff? outside of planet earth that is alive in some way how do you feel about that so i think this is where we start getting a little bit maybe into philosophy um but uh in terms of are there aliens out there almost certainly i i think that there is definitely life that exists elsewhere and especially if uh experiments that we're going to be start doing in the next couple of days uh next days but years on uh so like some of the moons on jupiter we have different experiments that we're wanting to do there because they're spewing out salt water which means wow. there's liquid water on these moons wow. which means there's potentially life because oceans are the bedrock of what our life evolved out of on earth so there's these other places on earth and uh, on in our solar system and if we can prove that life evolved independently within our solar system, that way changes the numbers in terms of how feasible and realistic is it that life exists out there somewhere else in the universe. If there is somewhere else in our solar system, almost certainly that means that there's going to be life on nearby uh, solar systems. Um, the other question of do aliens exist on slash have visited earth i'm gonna say probably not just from my the philosophy that i've spent a lot of time thinking about but again not a philosopher or any of those sorts of things but i feel like if aliens know of our existence and have the capability of being around us I think our best bet is having them to be where they are so high in like knowledge and everything that they kind of look us at, at us as a, like a fun little experiment and watching us evolve as we ping little different things out into space using chemical rockets and that sort of stuff uh, to where we're just an interesting thing to look at. Because whenever we start thinking about do aliens exist here on Earth, then we start to think about, OK, they have the technology to get here. Where did they come from? How technologically advanced do they have to be? What technologies do they have in, a, in addition to that? And then what can they do to us with that technology? And that starts getting into really, really interesting philosophy of like, what if they are hostile or what if they're not friendly or what if they are friendly? How will that sort of affect? But I based on like how our technology has kind of advanced in a fairly smooth curve, I don't necessarily see any huge advancements that would indicate that aliens had some sort of technology transfer. So that's where I kind of think about if aliens are out there, they're nearby and aware of Earth, more than likely there's some sort of uh, benevolent sort of beings in the universe that are kind of just observing us yeah i always had the feeling that I, I, like yourself i think there's definitely life out there it's absurd to think that there's, there's not in such a vast universe but i always had sort of the intuitive feeling that uh the presence isn't actually out to get us because i'm sure it's far more advanced than us and we would have been gone already if it right. wanted to get rid of us so i felt that it might even possibly play more of a guardian role i mean on the on the show they had things with uh where they're 
their rockets get disabled or explode and and this sort of stuff. And uh, the military recently has re- released a lot of information about how, how some of their equipment will be disabled when they're sort of dogfighting these UAPs and stuff. Mm. Um Yes. Yeah. It's an interesting uh, theory. I mean, they have captured on camera on the show on Skinwalker Ranch, they've captured now a lot of these balls of light moving on your show. Did you see any of those balls of light in the sky? I don't know if it was in your episode. It might not have been. You would know if you no, saw I, one I, of I these. I don't remember any of the times no. that I was on any sets that I saw any. Uh, no, either it was ball lightning or that. But uh... yeah, they were, and and of course nobody knows for sure. I mean, Doctor Travis Taylor is saying, well, it's they're saying it's not from our governments, you know. But of course, at the same time, it's like, well, the government's got to have all sorts of secret programs with <laughs> things that they're experimenting. So really, it could be 50-50 whether it's something that we're up to and something that's not of this earth kind of thing. That's another way I look at it is, I mean, there must be so many top secret government programs working on all sorts of things. But uh Hmm, interesting, interesting. Um, for for new hams, uh, are there any particular favorite websites or things that uh, you want to give a shout out to that uh, you discovered or that you know new hams would really enjoy? For example, I always give shout outs to like uh, parks on the air and summits on the air, where it's what can you do when you become a ham radio operator? What what's some of the fun that you can have? We've already touched upon Earth, Moon, Earth listening to the space station and trying to talk to the space station, which is amazing. Is there anything else that uh, you can point new hams to even just websites that, Hey, check this out. I mean, so, if I've stumped what, what, you as well, oh, I was going to say, <laughs> okay. I've just got, uh, where have I put it? I've just got uh, this radio that, because everybody, all of my fans kept talking about the DMR. Do you do DMR? Uh, Did you talk I, about the- radio? Uh, so the DMI being digital mode. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I I do. There's a couple of different things with digital modes that I've done. Um, I'll be honest. I don't really talk that much on ham radios and that sort of stuff. That's not really the sort of stuff that gets me super interested right. in uh, that sort of stuff, which I'll probably get into no a little bit later. Uh, but in terms of hams that are wanting to get into being uh, a ham and doing uh, communicating with different hams and that sort of stuff. I think the people's biggest, best, biggest and best resources are going to be their local clubs. Mm-hmm. So here we have uh, Park Ham- uh, Huntsville Amateur Radio Club, and these are everyone between uh, that I've seen uh, people who have been in the ham scene for multiple times longer than I've been alive to people who. Like whenever I was first joining, I was uh, a college student kind of wanting to get into ham radio for uh, doing high altitude balloons and rocketry and satellite stuff. Uh, But especially in our area, we have a lot of different resources for uh, like that sort of more uh, scientific payload sort of uh, ham radio application. But in addition to that, we have uh, a lot of people who do talk over the air and I've talked with them occasionally, but um, it's not something that I do a ton. Normally I do ham radio for say we're in a convoy of vehicles and we're traveling down for some sort of communications. It's really nice to be able to just key up and be like, uh, Hey, we are low on gas. We need to stop at this upcoming gas station and everyone uh, else in the convoy is able to just be like, right, right. right. Firm. We'll, we'll stop there. Yeah. So that, that's really nice not having to uh, do group texts right. or having to call everybody. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, but also whenever you're out in the field trying to recover rockets or trying to recover payloads, we normally have like a ground station set up at base camp and we're talking to all the different uh, hams that are in the field looking for either our different mock satellite payloads or gliders or rocket bodies or other sorts of things that we're able to relay information back to everybody who's out there and there's other times where like a lot of times where we're doing this competition we have uh 
a lot of kind of unfortunately medical incidents where oh. we have to uh like people who are from non Texas desert heat climates who are coming out in the middle dead heat of summer uh, out to these areas, not bringing enough water with them, not doing all these different things. If something happens to where someone faints and we're out in the middle of nowhere, Texas launching rockets. So you might not necessarily have a right. uh, signal. Right. They're able to call back to the, uh, our ground station and we're able to talk with all the coordinators and we're able to say, hey, someone out there has fainted. There are This is their coordinates. You need to go out there with a vehicle and go get them. Right. And right. so different sort of coordination or working with the other teams where, hey, we find a team's device that's not ours. Uh, can you let team 3439 tell them that we found that their rocket or something right. like that? Right. And so that sort of communications, but also uh, getting involved with Kind of like I was saying earlier, uh, New Hams might not always know all the different things that's open and available to them uh, whenever they have their ham radio license. And one of the really cool things out there is the APRS system or automated packet uh, reporting system where you can have uh, your little radio on a balloon. You can send it up and it goes around the earth. And because this system has been set up where you have a bunch of different independent radios hooked up to the internet, you're able to track your balloon as it goes around the globe pretty much anywhere that it is. And that's a really cool thing where whenever we're doing long duration scientific payloads, like we did back with the uh, Space uh, Hardware Club, where we're sending out several different, somewhere between one to maybe like five or six balloons at any one time. And we're wanting to track as many as that we can. It's really useful to have that APRS system because in real time, within a couple minutes of delay, we're able to see, okay, it's over Europe right now. And we're seeing all these different things. And uh, it's really useful because we're also, in addition to that, you can also send back additional uh, information over the APRS network as well, um, as well as cellular and other things. So there's a lot of different things that open up whenever you get your ham radio license. So I, I would say more than, uh, don't just look at communication is fantastic. It's wonderful for like what I was talking about, like emergency coordination. And if networks going networks go down or internet goes out or cell towers go down, like uh, unfortunately here in Huntsville over the past week, I've had uh, my power go out twice. Wow. Uh, so it's good to have ways to communicate with other people in, in emergencies, but also looking at, all right, I might be interested in ballooning. What are the different things that I can do using my ham radio license to do rocketry or uh, ballooning or space payloads? Now, I went to uh, the Yuma Ham Fest last year and I attended an APRS balloon launch and I found the whole thing very fascinating. You weren't there, were you? At last no, year's okay, <laughs> uh, because there was a lot of people, uh, and they sort of remind me of you with your enthusiasm for launching a balloon. And I found the whole thing really fascinated because everybody was really excited. They had these little boxes tied to string that was all going to take off like a little chain off the balloon, and the balloon was huge. Mm -hmm. like I thought it was going to be some little actual balloon. The balloon was <laughs> like the size of a balloon that would carry people up in the air. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was masses of excitement for this. Uh, and I would try and uh, say to people, so wh what are you attaching to that? Well, this is the payload. Okay, right. And and so what's the payload? Well, it's the payload. It's the payload. <laughs> and so what is it that you guys are dangling off these balloons and why? What is it actually yielding? Well, it really can be anything that you want it to be. Uh, a lot of the really simple things that you can do is uh, – get different pressure sensors and different thermometer uh, thermistors and stuff like that you can measure as you go up you can measure the uh temperatures of the atmosphere and uh you can measure as you're moving around you can track the balloon and so that tracks the different wind currents that are happening around the earth and one of the things that we are kind of learning with these weather balloons is that the high altitude jet streams are actually speeding up and so that's a benefit that we're seeing with all of these different uh balloon launches is that we're able to get a lot of different uh information from these scientific payloads uh that we can actually use for scientific endeavors but it doesn't have to be 
even that it could just be like i want to launch a piece of bread like uh, i don't know if you're familiar with uh uh scott uh oh boy what's his name again uh did he launch a piece of bread this man yes he 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 launched a piece of bread up to uh over a hundred thousand feet and then it popped and it came down and they ate the bread that came from over, over the Carmen line. So space bread, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it really, as long as you follow the, in the United States, the, uh, the federal guidelines for launching weather balloons, uh, you can pretty much, as long as you get your, the permission from the, uh, your ATC and the, uh, you're following the regulations you can launch whatever payloads that you really want so this One is local, that... local air traffic control just to be clear mm-hmm. local, you're saying? local so ATC. like phone the airport by you and go hey i want to launch a piece of bread you, you got a problem with this is that what you're saying you phone your local air traffic control and say i'm gonna launch a balloon with a payload i mean surely they must say well we need it this minimum miles away from any airport I mean, I'm sure there's got to be some restrictions of where you can float these things up, right? Yeah. So normally, you'd, like you were you were pointing out, you have the how your proximity to the airport is a right. really important consideration. But actually, one of your biggest considerations is how big is your balloon, making sure that you have uh, identified uh, where the string is so that they can see the payload in addition to uh, you have like streamers on the balloon. It's uh, on the cable itself. You have it to where it can be broken with 50 pounds of force. And the biggest one is really how quickly are you ascending? And okay. so normally there is a minimum. And a lot of times they will ask you for what is your proposed uh, trajectory? Well, like flight a trajectory. And, uh, and so you'd look at, there's a lot of really great resources out there online where you can plug in what your payload mass is, what kind of balloon you're using, what your fill, or uh, normally what they do is you measure using a little device like this, what your lift is. And so you kind of have a, uh, say I have 600 grams of lift on a 200 gram payload. This is how quickly I expect it to ascend. And you go to your F, uh, your local air, air traffic controller and say, hey, this is my this is my flight plan, effectively. And really, as long as you follow those regulations, uh, it, it's something that like universities, individuals do a lot of the time. And there's also uh, several different, like you were pointing out, different ham radio clubs that will also send up their own payloads. So there's a lot of different things where it doesn't have to be a super big scientific missions, even though I've been part of the club that does that. We were looking at uh, different terrestrial gamma ray bursts with lightning clouds and all this scientific things that we're writing paper research papers on in coordination with NASA. And we were having NASA scientists work with us. But that's not something that you always have to do. Like a lot of things that we would do for like one month and different things is we would do uh, egg drops where it would you different kids would put different things into eggs and then the balloon would go up, the payload would cut down, and you would have the uh, eggs fall and. It see sounds it, like a or... a TikTok trend. Let's get the, <laughs> the egg a hundred thousand feet up. 100,000 foot egg drop challenge. <laughs> are ATC pretty accommodating with this sort of thing? Or are they like, oh, it's another ham, you know? <laughs> um, it, it really depends on uh, how you're approaching it. If you are being calm and uh, cordial and you have all the information that you need with them, normally they're really willing to work with you. Um, and even whatever we were with the Space Hardware Club, we actually had a air traffic controller representative assigned to us. So we would have a pretty good working relationship with them. We would tell them, hey, this is our proposed different thing. We're doing a outreach payload. We're putting 10, 500 gram uh, payloads on top of this string. We're expecting them to all release by this altitude. We have a master cape uh, cutoff that's expected to cut off at this altitude. But if all that fails, this is our expected trajectory. So I mean, they're, they're... what about them coming down, though? I mean, you can't always go and retrieve them, can you? 
No, so the there another one of the regulations that you have is a density requirement. So uh, it c- can only be below four pounds if it's a specific cross section density, and that's for uh, terminal velocity purposes. Uh, and then you have like up to six pounds total. But normally, what you do is you put these different payloads into big foam coolers because you're wanting electronics don't like being cold they don't like being hot they don't like really big temperature swings really quickly because that can cause problems so you want to insulate these things as much as possible and in effect you kind of make sure that you're not falling too quickly but normally you also put uh different parachutes like I got a big old parachute right here that I do for a couple of our payloads. So if the balloon pops or something happens or uh, it cuts down for some weird reason to because uh, it hits a big, really big gust of wind and that causes it to exceed the 40 pounds of force, we want to make sure that uh, we get our instruments back uh, safely if it's things that we're expecting to retrieve. But there's also the other payloads that you don't expect to retrieve. And those are kind of like your cheaper disposable APRS trackers or other things that you do global. And uh, I mean, for anybody listening, I know a website you can go right now is APRS.FI and people can see what mm -hmm. this looks like on a map with things moving around on there. What percentage of uh, the things that you guys launch into the air would you say you recover? So that really depends on the type of mission. If it's something that is going to be only going up uh, a couple hundred feet to a couple thousand feet, 90 plus percent in terms of things that we're doing around the world, uh, almost zero. Uh, There's a couple of them that go up to 100,000 feet and pop there. Normally those only go a couple of states in either direction. Uh, We get about 20 to 30 percent of those back. Is it, I mean, I heard that when the U.S. military shot down something after the spy balloon, that that was a ham balloon. Yep. And I actually (laughs) went over to it and I looked at it and I found the organization that was doing it and they were, and they're like, yep, our balloon just got shot down by the Air Force. (laughs) I I would hate to be that person. (laughs) I mean, how is the Air Force not able to detect that it's a ham radio balloon? Like, aren't there so, certain markers where they don't have to go wasting their rockets on ham radio balloons? So I would almost certainly say that they knew it was a ham radio balloon. I'll leave the rest to that. <laughs> oh, so maybe it was like a more of a bravado. We got it. We got it. Or just to send a message, we're shooting anything down. Don't send anything over our airspace as it's coming down, you know? Yeah. And, and unfortunately, uh, it might be closer to the second. I don't like getting into politics or that no, sort of stuff. No but one, of the, one of the things that uh, is in Congress right now is a uh, bill to potentially limit the ability of universities and individuals to send up weather balloons. Um, I'm really hoping that doesn't get get passed because there is so much scientific and also outreach potential with these balloons. Um, but that is a potential law coming in the States is uh, limiting the ability to launch weather balloons. I mean, I'm part of ARES, the Amateur Radio Emergency Services. And one of the people in there, he has done uh, the APRS balloons. And I said, if they ever landed in awkward places and he had one come down on a military installation and he said, like, they weren't very happy that <laughs> this foreign item falls down on their military base. I mean, if I were the Air Force, I would say I don't want any of these ham radio operators sending balloons up. I don't want to even risk the chance of spending time uh, shooting down these things. So I get I can see their side and I can see your side. I mean, the fact that these things are sent to float around the world, I mean, couldn't one of them theoretically land on a highway and, you know, the balloon part falls across somebody's windshield and they can't see? Because, I mean, there's no control over where they land, right? Right. There, normally, normally there is no control of where they land. But with, like, the way that uh, balloons are kind of frangible, they kind of, if you take a look at them exploding, there's not very big pieces of the weather balloon that kind of come down normally they come down in small little clumps to where they are not 
really a hazard to okay. people and following all the different other rules of uh, density requirements and other okay. stuff. Uh, normally, it's not that bad. Some of them have been struck by planes. So that's why you have that uh, 50 pound force of uh, striking to where if, it, if something hits it with 50 pounds of force, it must be able to uh, be cut. Right. Um, but also all these engines are designed with bird strikes in mind. So right. uh, the mass requirements and the density requirements means that it's not going to be like a big thing of metal to where it's going to be causing too much damage to these uh, things. But you have like different lighting requirements and whatnot uh, just to make sure that they are seeable by the airlines. But normally you they're only very short durations through the point of space where jet planes will fly. Uh, because when it, whenever you are wanting these to go around the world, normally you are miles higher than any time that uh, these planes would be flying by. And what about the parachutes? Because they're going to fall to Earth, aren't they? They're not going to dissolve because you want your payload to land safely. Do those ever land in squirrely places where parachutes are not welcome? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, they but normally like we we uh had a couple of times where th they land in different people's properties but normally whenever we explain to them hey this is who we are this is what we're doing normally they're really kind of even people who are initially fairly aggressive will kind of be like oh okay that, well, that's kind of like, cool yeah that you're it's doing like a that science thing. project mm -hmm. and, and, and normally we do outreach and that sort of stuff and like hey we were doing this with high school and middle school kids to get them interested yeah. in engineering uh we have a couple of different payloads this is what they are this is what they do they're right. safe they're okay because we, we we put all of our uh contact information on them so they'll call us up we've even had where uh, it's landed in someone's tree and they cut it down for us so we could get it back. And that was, that was a wow. cool experience where uh, someone in the community, and this was States away wow. where they were willing to work with us to even cutting down a tree to help us get our payload back. Oh, that's very nice. Hmm. Well, um, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but there was one thing I know that you're also a somewhat expert in, I believe, and that is the satellites and is is that fair to say you're you're pretty savvy on the whole ham radio satellite thing or have i uh misinterpreted um so i do have experience with like building uh doing different research uh with the university on them uh we launched one a, a satellite and uh i was part of the doc looking at the documentation and uh looking at potentially doing another one and i believe they were doing uh another one after i left i never worked on them directly but i was very familiar with like what we had done uh and that sort of stuff so i wouldn't consider myself an expert on it but i would can say that i'm familiar with it especially with like uh the from the uh university side of things trying to launch uh a CubeSat satellite as either like a high school or a university. Uh, I would say that I do have a decent bit of knowledge in terms of that sort of stuff. Well, I And then also like building it up and having the ham radio stuff as well. Well, I wasn't even thinking in terms of the building them. So to me, that's already very impressive that you've been <laughs> involved in making satellites. I'm more, uh, I thought that you'd mentioned something when we had our little text exchange about working satellites. You know, when mm. ham radio operators say have you worked satellites yeah yeah so that was that so unfortunately i never worked our satellite um due to a couple of technical problems but i have done a couple of different things where i have worked different satellites one of the really cool things you can do with your uh your uh, RTL SDR, as well as any other uh, SDR type radio, and even uh, non SDR types, is you can, uh, if you look at the NOAA weather satellites, okay, you can actually get the imagery off of that and reconstruct the images that are being sent back to NASA on and a dongle. That's really on a dongle. Good God. And wow. so you, you you can look up uh, the NOAA weather satellites you can do. I've done a couple of different CubeSats uh, here and there that were university ones where they had uplink and downlink. Uh, most of them wow. were just echo sats. Um, there, and sometimes I'll just be interested in like, all right, I have this antenna. Uh, 
that we've made and all right what can we get with it what satellites are are overhead hey there's this one cube set that is uh just dopplering over uh 400 megahertz and so you'll occasionally hear a ping from it and that sort of thing kind of like the same sort of thing that people heard back whenever sputnik was flying over so i have the NOAA uh satellites all i have all of them on my geocron so i go to a NOAA website and i put the frequency in do they i guess and i put it in the rtl sdr how does the mm -hmm. picture appear like sort of through the waterfall so what you do is you actually take a recording of the uh frequency that so all the no weather satellites they have the frequencies that they're on published so you take a recording of that you put it into a software and that software will actually ah. uh compose this photo for you so uh oh, i'm forgetting so the name clever. of the software right now it's been that's a couple so years clever. since I've it. so what would i google sdr photo software so what you would probably do is look up NOAA weather satellite ham radio photos. Okay. That sounds so clever. Wow. Um, yeah, that's so the part that I'm just curious is when people say working satellites, what do they even mean though with radios? So a lot of times what you can do, uh, they're very, a lot of them can actually be very similar to repeaters to where what you do is you transmit up to the different satellite and it'll just echo it back down on your second on the secondary frequency and so you can talk to other people over satellite the same thing you would with uh okay. a standard sort of repeater so okay. that, that same sort of uh different thing but okay you would be focused rather than working a specific repeater you would be work focused on working a specific satellite i see and so this is where you'd want to go uh looking at some clever web browser that would show where they are at different times mm -hmm. so you'd and it would give you the... your yeah similar you to the, the direction ISS. you need to look okay. at you need to look at uh your, your altitude so basically the direction you need to okay. point at uh, in addition to the frequency so uh okay you could do the same sort of thing. Also, there are some apps that will tell you what's in the sky. So you can also take a look at uh, aircraft. They have all the radios that are sending down. You can uh, see those on your SDR radio as well. Uh, but you can take a look at these different apps. They'll tell you where different satellites are sometimes in the sky, and they'll be able to send down. Uh, using that, you'll be able to point your antennas in the same direction because it's not pinpoint uh you do have a little bit of a radiation pattern okay. that you're able to receive from uh so you do have a couple of degrees of slew that you're able to work around with uh but the more precise you are the more uh data that you're actually going to be able to have with full integrity because if you're bouncing around you'll miss a couple pixels here and there uh but or you'll have signal degradation here and there if you're talking to someone else but if you're using kind of like what I have here, you're able to put it in and say, this is the orbital rate that it has, and it'll be able to go to and that sort of thing. And so uh, there's just a lot of really, and you don't have to buy super something super fancy like this. Uh, I was just doing it because it's a small little compact package that I can take backpacking yeah. wherever I go. Uh, you can, there are plenty of people out there who have built and have guides on building your own. Uh, it would be uh, a tracker, a satellite, not satellite tracker, but a uh, a radio uh, direction device where it'll, most of them are going to be just rotational, but there are some that also will do your altitude as well. So mm. there's plenty of different uh, guides out there to where if you're wanting to get a little bit more in depth rather than hit, uh, holding up a Yagi, where you have a device holding up the Yagi right. for you and pointing for you and tracking for you, uh, there's people out there who have software that they've developed that is free to you for anyone to download and use or uh, be able to uh, but there are plenty of other people who are selling these different devices out there for uh, about what we would be able to uh, make it for. But because they do it a little bit more and they have access to more of them, economies of scale means that they can sell it to you as well. So there's a lot of different resources out there that you can uh, look at being able to do the same sort of thing. Um, when you work satellites, are those the sort of bands that are on an HT? Yeah. So a okay. lot of them are going to be in the 144 and 400, okay. uh, those, those sorts of uh, bands. 
there are plenty of websites that are out there that will tell you like like uh, ham radio set. I, I don't remember any of the website. I'm really. The, that's I'm all right. We can names. Google I'm ham radio. That. No, that's all right. Ham radio satellite websites, basically. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they'll give you the, the specific orbits that are yeah. in and you'll be able to. And I believe there's even a couple that will uh, that are the same sort of map that you have there. And they'll show you like where they are in space as well. And uh, you'll be able to figure out which ones you can work. Very cool. And have you done that? Have you done that? Yes, I've done that a couple of times. And so if you can manage to hit a satellite, how far can you get? Generally? So it'll be in whatever that cone of influence that that okay. satellite can do. So same okay. sort of thing with uh, like working the ISS. Got it. Uh, most of these are going to be low Earth orbit. I think there are a couple in GEO. So there might be a couple that might be able to get the entirety of the United States as well. Wow. Pretty clever stuff. Well, well, gosh, um, I feel I've learned so much talking to you. Is there anything else that you specifically wanted to promote or to talk about before we wrap up? I know I've sort of been suggesting the topic. So if there's anything you wanted to speak about. Oh, no, I, I, I definitely appreciate being able to talk with this. Um, like I mentioned earlier, outreach is one of my biggest things that I'm uh, very passionate about. So being able to give additional information that might spark someone's interest like oh i didn't know you could do that yeah that is the, the those are the types of things that uh i really enjoy but as always making sure that you follow the federal regulations of yes. uh what you're doing it's always yeah. important to follow the law to be right. sure that you're able to do things again in the future and make sure that not just yourself but being a good good steward for everyone else who's wanting right. to do the same sort of stuff launch um, that piece of bread from the right space Right. And with the proper permission, with the proper uh, permission on the bread. <laughs> right. But uh, going out there and doing stuff, getting involved with different groups that are interested. We are in a wonderful time where we're able to have different groups online where we can go on to Facebook and say, all right, I'm interested in doing this type of ham radio stuff. I want to uh, go out and launch balloons with different people. I want to go out and expedition days or field days or all these different things and being involved with different people because face-to-face interaction even though we're ham radio and so we want to be able to talk to other people uh over the ham radios face-to-face -face involvement is also really important yeah i think um, so too i think so and your advice was great to find a local ham club i always tell people you need to find an elma as soon as possible get yourself an elma who can teach you all those basic things that you feel embarrassed to ask which i still have things that i'm <laughs> like what does this even actually mean you know um well as we wrap up i'll just put in the video a shout out my whole TikTok channel is dedicated to getting people involved in ham radio and showing what you can do and showing the great friendships you can make. And if you want to do it for fitness, there's the parks on the air and summits on the air. If you're into the science, you've already talked about a spectrum of things with APRS and satellites and real space uh, directions. People can do radio astronomy where they mm. can uh, get into really cool stuff like that. So, um, uh, so for me, if you're listening to this, check out TikTok tiktok at glam ham radio and the same uh, handle on youtube and what about uh, have you got socials that you like for people to check out uh, or are you, are you more behind the scenes how social are you so i do have a twitter uh you can find me at my name jerry stover spike uh i have a threads as well i'm not super active on them but if you reach out to me i i'm sure i'll be able to have, find some time to talk back to you especially with uh new hands and that sort of people just kind of coming out and learning. Uh, but one last thing I do want to say is in addition to finding an Elmer, find someone who you can call a buddy and who is about on the same technical level as you, someone that you can grow together with. And having someone like that is also uh, really will really help you get comfortable with working with ham radio stuff. So, yeah, but that's Go ahead cool. and uh, nice. if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on any of those platforms. If you search my name, I'm sure you'll be able to find something of mine. I will be reaching out with my questions <laughs> because I'm going to have a lifetime of questions because ham radio is that license to learn. Absolutely. You know, it's amazing. Well, thank you, uh, Jera, so much for taking the time out. And it was awesome to see you uh, representing ham radio on Skinwalker Ranch. Do you think uh, you'll go back at all? 
That's a big question. We'll figure that out in the future if they come <laughs> Maybe. Back I hope so. I hope so. I liked to see the ham radio presence there. So I will uh, uh, sign off and say, uh, Jerry Stoverspike, thank you very much and take care and 7-3. 